Thank you so much, Deepak. Thank you, everybody, and request you all to settle down. And welcome to session two. After that amazing session one, this, this session also promises to be very, very interesting. Uh, public affairs as a profession, you know, and now today spans public policy, government relations, corporate communication, CSR. And PAFI truly has been one of those organizations and bodies which aims to bring everybody together to be able to collaborate and build trust amongst all these stakeholders. And the session today is going to talk about how do we look at the long-term strategy, the CEO's perspective. We're going to focus on the role of the private sector and its commitment to participating and driving a conducive and predictable policy regime. The panel today will, of course, discuss some of the key priorities what do CEOs expect from their public affairs team? What are they looking for in terms of the role that the industry can play in charting out this growth that we want for the country? How do you align profit to purpose? Uh, recently, a lot of you have heard about the founder of Patagonia committing to climate change. Do we need more heroes like that? Will India be able to put in some more? So I think looking at purpose and how does that drive strategy today for organizations and to build our growth. So without much further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists today. I'm going to start with Sunil Bhaskaran, CEO of Air Asia, who's been with the Tata Group for over 35 years in key roles and leading businesses. Next to him, we have Jason Oxman, who is coming all the way from Washington to be here with us today. Thank you, Jason. He's the president and CEO of the Information Technology Industry Council. It's a global trade association which focuses on tech and policy to make the difference. We also have um, Pranshu Singhal. I've just skipped one and I'll come back to you, Anil. Uh, Pranshu is the founder of Karo Sambhav, which collaborates with companies making circular economy possible. And he's going to share some of his interesting ideas and stories with us today. And yes, uh, sitting right in the center, we have our moderator, Anil Padmanabhan. All of you are very familiar with him, journalist par excellence, 35 years, and most recently also the managing editor for The Mint. And last but not the least, my colleague, Ishtayak Ahmed. Uh, he needs no introduction, PAFI council member, one of the core pillars of PAFI in the work that we do every day. So with that, I'm going to hand you over to Anil to take us through this session. Thank you, Deepchika, and uh, thank you for saving us the blushes of being a manil. Uh, the, uh, actually, <laughs> yeah, so the speaker dropped out, so... So now Deepshika has saved us today. So thank you, and thank you, Pafi, for having me here. And uh, every year I tell you this, congratulations. Uh, I know from where you started, from that little room at IAC, and now to see this very expanded, scaled up thing, fantastic. Many congratulations to all of you. Uh, what we'll do is I'll just jump into it, because we just have about 45 minutes. And uh, we got three speakers. So each of them will make a short uh, introductory remarks, and then we'll jump into a conversation. So I just move from the right to the left. Sunil, if you can go first. Uh, good morning, and uh, thank you, Anil, and thank you, Papi, for having me here. Uh, so two quick comments I would like to uh, make. I think we had a very interesting session with the minister uh, so clearly expounding uh, the, uh, the national view on uh, how the country wants to address this towards 2047. Uh, two key areas I would like to uh, mention. One is, uh, I think we need to build on our strength. And one of the big strengths uh, which has panned out over the last 20 years is in the area of technology and uh, digital. And uh, I don't think much of the world believed that a country which has an average per capita income of $2,000 could become such a leader in the high-tech sector globally. And I think that's a clear strength that we have. Uh, many factors have come into it to make it happen. But to ensure that it moves up from this level, 
uh, and and really can uh, you know differentiate India uh, in a much bigger manner it's uh, very important it's uh, interesting to note uh, that our software exports uh, today are almost equivalent to what Saudi Arabia uh, exports in oil uh, and uh, in in I've heard it from many of our consult friends from the US that in the top uh, companies boardrooms the, the conversations 20 years ago uh, used to be about uh, low end IT uh, and how uh, cost arbitrage uh, could make the difference today everybody is investing in their top technology uh, uh, strategy and development and execution in in uh, in their entities out of India so I think that's a big uh, big journey which has happened uh, within India, I think it's, it's clearly been shown how technology can be used at scale uh, to address, uh, you know, the big issues uh, that we had. You have examples of Aadhaar, uh, UPI, the way FastTag was implemented, the way Coven was implemented. In my own sector in aviation, I think there are stuff which is happening, which can really show technology being implemented at scale, uh, which can really address uh, these issues in a big way. So I think we have a big, big uh, advantage, and I think we should uh, push for using the strength in an even bigger manner going forward. That's one, and the other part, of course, is to ensure that the growth is inclusive, and to that extent, the priorities in terms of education and healthcare is very important. That's uh, just a quick beginning, Anil. Oh, great, that's extremely brief, but yeah. thank you. <laughs> Jason? Thanks so much, Anil. And uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, and congratulations to Pathy on putting on a phenomenal in-person event it's great to be all together and uh, to be able to shake hands and make eye contact is so much different than the digital world. The digital world is terrific, but uh, there's no substitution for being together uh, in person. I, I want to uh, pick up, uh, uh, as Sunil said, on the exciting opportunity for the digital economy here uh, in uh, India. And one of the things that the technology industry is so excited about, as we heard from the Honorable Minister, is the updates that are taking place at a rather rapid clip to the regulatory uh, and policy environment here in India. India is the world's largest democracy. That by itself is exciting. But the digitization that's taking place across India is nothing short of remarkable. And I say that as someone who had to bring their paper COVID vaccine card with them to travel <laughs> to India. And I look around and over a billion people have their digital records available to them the minute they get their shot. I say that as someone who uh, walked up to the desk at my hotel to exchange some currency and was met uh, by strange looks from people around me who wondered what exactly I planned to do with cash. Uh, I say that as someone who went asked for ID and pulled my plastic driver's license out of my wallet, why it is that that's not on my phone like it is for everybody here. The economy here, the story of digitization, is one that the world should be paying attention to. And I'm excited on behalf of the technology industry to have the opportunity to participate in it. We do have, of course, breaking news about the Telecom Act rewrite, as the Honorable Minister was talking about earlier. And I should say, Anil, I read first about it in uh, the Mint uh, last night. That was the breaking news outlet that I saw um, before getting a copy of the, uh, the draft legislation. We should also take uh, counsel from the minister and focus on the opportunities that are here in India as we counsel and make our recommendations on how the policy environment can best support competition, competitive entry in India's position. As India prepares to take leadership of the G20, I think it's a unique opportunity to showcase all of the work that's happening and will happen from financial services with digital payments, a truly electronic payment environment here, to the citizen services that are available online, to healthcare, to education. Uh, it, it's a remarkable story to tell. So in the technology industry in particular, we're focused on the public policy environment and advocating for the kind of open competitive marketplace that India has had and will continue to have. The fact that the telecom law rewrite is taking place uh, in an environment where the law was written in 1885 uh, and actually called the Telegraph Act because the Telegraph was the technology of the day, uh, that creates enormous opportunities uh, for us to incur uh, encourage competition. The fact that the privacy law that's being uh, focused on, the personal data protection law, uh, which as the uh, Honorable Minister mentioned, uh, is uh, a, re a rewrite effort um, in the face of new environments, new issues, new com competitive opportunities, uh, that creates a great opportunity for investment. 
I was particularly excited to see the, uh, the news uh, from the Honorable Prime Minister and his cabinet uh, from yesterday about the update to the semiconductor incentives. The Make in India program and the PLI program, the incentives for manufacturing, has been enormously successful and will be even more successful in encouraging manufacturing in India. But what I saw in the update to the semiconductor program was a reflection of the fact that semiconductors are an ecosystem and the updates will allow th those kind of investments to be made, not only in the manufacturing of the semiconductor itself, but also in the packaging, in the testing, in the research and development and design. The intellectual capital that's present here in India is unparalleled in the world. The technological know-how and that intellectual capacity that India exports to the world is as important an investment as the investment in the actual physical construction of, project, of products uh, here in India as well. So we're excited about that and look forward to working with all of you to continue the remarkable digital economy story that India has told and will soon be telling on the global stage. Thank you, Jason. And uh, it's interesting to note that two of our speakers are focused on the hottest thing about India right now is digital economy. But uh, there's also a real economy happening, and uh, Pranchal will walk us through that change. So it will be an interesting mix. Over to you. Thank you, Anil. Uh, greetings to all. So I'll, I'll put some dialogue on circular economy. And uh, we are all talking about it. It has become kind of talk of the town in the last uh, couple of years. But what is really circular economy, and are we really making it happen? Uh, and that remains a big question mark to me. So, and what can it do? Uh, the biggest thing I think, if I were to think from a pure digital perspective, uh, we are really running out of materials to make products. You know, in a few years from now, we will run out of uh, available uh, rare earths. We will run out of uh, multiple other materials to make diodes, capacitors. Uh, and if we have to really bring resilience, then we need to look at waste in a very different way. We need to think of products in a very, very different way. And this is not just true for electronics, we can look at any sector. Uh, today we know where to buy products from, but we don't know what to do at the end of their life. And uh, each and every product is dependent on natural ecosystems. And uh, the natural ecosystems are in huge decline. So the good thing is, at least there is a great dialogue in India happening on circular economy. Niti Aayog has set up uh, 11 circular committees and uh, uh, focused on specific sectors. And uh, while you know a lot of action is still to happen, but the good thing is the policy initiative is beginning. What is required at this point in time is how do we add depth to that dialogue and how do we put the business muscle behind it? And that is something which I truly find is missing today. We have a lot of talk, but almost no action. Uh, action is more focused on can I just be compliant? Can I just do some PR? Can I just talk about it? Uh, very few rare instances of real action, real drive, is happening at a grassroots level. Uh, and I want to be very, very candid about this here. Uh, now, if we are talking of change, this is a change at a population scale. Uh, I'm using the same term that the minister talked today because uh, this can't be for a few households for a few companies. This is really population scale. Anything that we are creating today needs to be uncreated. Uh, let me take a very simple example of products that we all use, a laptop. Uh, would you know that the plastics in laptop are actually unreusable? Majority of it cannot be used to make back, if I were to recreate laptops from the same plastic, I actually can't use it. Uh, and this is true for, if I go product by product, we would find at least 70 to 80% of the products which are non-utilizable. Uh, we cannot uncreate them. We cannot extract back materials to create new products which can go back in the economy. And this is becoming a huge challenge. I see three big uh, solutions here. The first is the technological solutions. And this goes into, can we really design, redesign our products in a way that materials can be extracted? And the fact that there are technologies available for extraction. Today we really don't have, not enough uh, money has been put, not enough R&D has been done in that space. Very little money, very little, uh, I would say frugal innovation has been applied on that side. The second is the lifestyle and the behavioral changes. How are we selling this story? Both internally within the companies because 
circular economy will only happen if all of us within the organization, whether I'm a brand manager, marketing manager, sales manager, we are all deeply enthusiastic by that idea. It will just not happen if, you know, if a sustainability manager is driving it or a uh, corporate affairs director is leading it. So how do we embed it deeply? Uh, and this lifestyle change would then percolate to individuals, to peoples, to communities who would then come forward to participate. And the third is the policy. Uh, the good news from an India perspective is that the pilot policy dialogues has started to happen. Where it goes from here is yet to be seen. But uh, I see a very, very huge possibility of you know, support coming from forums like this, groups like this to really make it happen. Today that support, while in dialogue is there, but in real action is you know, questionable. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I think the, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, is, uh, Ranchi, thank you for flagging sustainability in the conversation that we are about to have. And uh, I, it's, I'll, what I'll do is, uh, there we have got about 35 minutes, and uh, we'll go for about 15 minutes among us, and we'll open it up for questions. So, please, ready your questions before that. The, um, my, if I had to, I, as a question for all three of you, Jason, we'll give you honorary citizenship digitally. Thank you. So, so uh, if, you know, if I ask, I want to ask each of you <clears throat> to fundamentally, you know, forget about, I mean, you heard the minister, so, uh, and you've seen all the progress, you've talked about the digital economy, etc. So these challenges before us uh, today, that what we see today, are uh, unlikely to exist if this space and momentum are retained uh, in another 10, 15 years. So when you're looking at 2047, India is going to be very, very different. So if you, I think it's time, like the minister said, for a mindset reset, he was talking about investments, but I believe, I think there's to be a larger mindset reset in this country because there's a lot of legacy which we are carrying forward because that's the way we used to do. So I think you have to rethink the way we are going to do things. So in that backdrop, that is just to explain issues. So Nil, I'll begin with you. So I said, suppose uh, <clears throat> you have to fundament, imagine a fundamental new process with the, what the minister pointed out and what Pranchal also pointed out, citizens at the center, you know? So, and leverage technology, which both of you mentioned, and uh, of course, encourage innovation. What is it that one process that you would recommend today? Good, good question, uh, Anil. I think, uh, and since this is the public affairs uh, uh, forum, uh, I, I think the uh, uh, the uh, the partnership between uh, government can create policy, and policy can come out of a lot of the conversations along with industry, community, state, common citizen. But this uh, this policy needs to get executed uh, better to really impact uh, the common man. And one big enabler today is technology, like you said, which can really help policy get uh, executed, implemented on scale. Uh, even if we were to take something like education, the kind of different models which are working in uh, all over the country in different states, are, many of them are absolutely cutting edge. And uh, uh, you know, I have a lot of confidence having seen them from close, uh, that it could lead to the kind of paradigm shift or the uh, you know, outcomes in education that all of us are hoping, because it's not just hope, there's lots of uh, different pilots, uh, experiments, uh, supportive governments uh, which are happening. So if, if there was one process which needs to get uh, even further uh, streamlined, it's this uh, entire process of consensus building uh, very quickly, like uh, what the minister talked about, in terms of uh, making the policy, and then how best to get it in executed with the partnership of everybody in the ecosystem, which is not just the government and industry, but also community, uh, and finally the uh, people. Uh, so in that space, I think uh, the need for this uh, partnership uh, and where uh, if, if the public policy experts are, are big, uh, you know, partners or big players in this role between the industry and government, I think uh, apart from what was earlier expected that these are, uh, you know, uh, professionals who helped navigate that bureaucratic maze, uh, it needs to be more about, uh, uh, you know, potential business leaders within industry and within companies uh, taking on those roles uh, to to ensure that there's better understanding uh, between both. I think the last point that the minister talked about for the public policy students was about building trust. 
And I think that's a very important part for public policy professionals to build that credibility, both within the company, uh, because they're carrying the company's uh, views across to bureaucracy, but much more uh, for the bureaucracy to have trust uh, that this is uh, coming from deep understanding of the industry, deep understanding of the ecosystem and what the interplays are, and therefore, uh, uh, you know, suggestions uh, which could come out with uh, better policy. I don't know whether I addressed your question, no, Anil, but... No, uh, Sunil, uh, I think you... Uh, I'll just raise the difficulty quotient for you, so... <laughs> <laughs> because I know it's an off-the-syllabus question, but it's something I thought of on the way, and I heard the minister, and so I just want to uh, actually take advantage of the kind of backdrop that all of you come from, and you can definitely contribute. So, uh, Sunil, uh, you're a CEO and uh, you're a change agent. So my question is, what I'm uh, beginning actually from Ishtayak also triggered it when he asked the minister that what is it that we can do? So it's in that context that what would you do if you, you're the CEO of a company and there's one single process that you want to change, which is not for today. I'm talking of not even tomorrow. I'm talking of one week, talking of uh, 25 years from now. So. What is it that you will change? Because these problems will go away. Yep. I think we have to start with that premise. Start with the control all Dell moment, you know. And so what is that? So, that's so, so Anil, I'll take it, I'll bring it more specific to my industry uh, in aviation. And I think our biggest problem, which is we don't see in India so much, is about the sustainability perspective. And, uh, you know, it was mentioned over there. Uh, I think it's far closer to the people on the ground if you were to be in Europe or US, but it's not so much so here in India because all the key parameters will start kicking in from 2027. And today in an industry where you are really, uh, you know, trying to survive, uh, it's difficult to uh, try and spend effort on, on, on aviation, uh, on sustainability. And sustainability in aviation, unlike other industries where, are, where there are 10 parameters, 99% uh, of that uh, comes from the use of fuel, uh, which needs to be, uh, you know, uh, for, for the flights to take place. And to get an answer to that, uh, there's a lot of industry-wide initiatives which are very far in the future, uh, but the biggest solution seems to be sustainable aviation fuel. And uh, towards that, uh, I think the kind of work which we are trying to get all participants, whether it's the civil aviation sector, whether it's the petroleum and natural gas uh, sector, whether it's uh, Indian oil or the oil companies, whether it's uh, new age companies which are looking at investing in this. So, to, so although the, uh, the problem is way far ahead in the future, the conversations on how to build the policy parameters, how to build the support parameters to get it, uh, you know, uh, manufactured in India. Uh, India has some potential uh, advantages compared to the rest of the world. But today, the cost of that fuel is five times what the normal fuel is. So it looks like, you know, out of uh, reach and impossible. But it's a, it's a solution which needs to get uh, done over the next few years for aviation to be sustainable. So within this particular problem, within this uh, specific initiative, I think we are seeing good traction uh, between uh, these ministries. Ministry of Road Transport is also involved, Ministry of uh, Petroleum and Natural Gas, Ministry of Civil Aviation, the industry. Only yesterday, the Tata Airlines, uh, which is Air India, Air Asia India, and Vistara, we signed an MOU with the Indian Institute of Petroleum, which is part of the Council of uh, CSIR. Uh, and they have very leading edge pilots and uh, work happening today. Uh, which will lead to some of these things. And again, uh, my confidence is extremely high that we will probably find solutions in India uh, ahead and different uh, from the rest of the world. So I'm just taking a specific uh, uh, you know, Fair. piece to address how it would be. And I think the process is working, working well. It is far away, but uh, the pain is being felt. Uh, the industry, research, government, partnerships are working, and the conversations are happening. Thank you. Jason, uh same question to you, but you also are outside looking in. So you're a keen observer of India. So, so I look at this from the, it's a great question, and uh, thinking ahead and counseling our students about what they should be thinking about to advocate 10, 15 years from now. Uh, I think I view this from the perspective of an Indian startup in the technology sector. And thinking about, as a startup, if I want to enter this exciting innovation economy, what do I need from the government? How do I want to position myself vis-a-vis -vis the government? Um, and uh, this is something that uh, companies across the technology ecosystem uh, face all the time. And, and, and as the minister said, the whole philosophy behind the re-examination of 
the regulatory environment here in India is to make sure that the next generation of technology companies, I mean, there are some great tech companies uh, up here on the sponsorship list that are members of ITI, great technology companies across India, um, but we're talking about the next generation, uh, building the next unicorn. What do they need from government? So uh, the proper role of government, of course, is to make sure the environment is conducive to those startups having a chance, making sure they have access to the capital they need, making sure that uh, new entrants can compete with legacy companies. And, and you know, thinking about the Telecom Act and uh, back in uh, 1885, the telegraph was it. So the role of government in uh, setting the environment there uh, with a monopoly provider of service was very different than today. And I think uh, making sure that the government understands, in the case of technology companies, making sure Métis understands um, what's necessary to compete uh, to be successful 10, 15 years from now is enormously important. One of the parts of a, a statute that uh, people tend to kind of gloss over to get into the meat of it is the definition section. And I would encourage everybody to look at the definition section because we all have it in our packets of the new draft telecom bill. The definition section is actually incredibly broad and suggests that new companies that are entering uh, the telecom space um, include companies in, that are internet providers, content providers, video providers, satellite providers, companies that are not traditionally within the regulatory ambit uh, of the, the, the government. That's a very interesting and important thing to think about if you're a startup in the, in the ecosystem here. Now, obviously, the government has a role to play in regulating legacy service providers who may have access to things that the government can give. Uh, for example, Spectrum, which belongs to the people of India, but the government licenses it out. It's obviously appropriate for the government to regulate users of Spectrum. Even legacy telecom companies, even if they're competitive today, not owned by the government, they have access to rights of way and other benefits of government. But all those new ecosystem startups that now may be subject to licensing requirements and other obligations of government um, don't have any of those legacy benefits. So for the startup ecosystem, that's the kind of thing you need to think about. Am I gonna be subject to licensing requirements? Am I gonna have to share my data with government as a result of this new telecom bill? 15 years from now, if you have those obligations on you, your business is gonna look very different than it would today if you didn't have those obligations on you. So those are the kind of things that I think are important to think about. The definition section, again, something that you don't usually read but in something like the new telecom bill, incredibly important to think about how that impacts the ability of innovative startups uh, in India and what government regulations they may be subject to as they attempt to enter the digital economy. Thank you, Jason. Uh, you actually touched on a very interesting issue uh, that you dwelled on the bill, is the business of regulation. Uh, actually, since you're a tech person, uh, just we'll come back to you on this, but just a passing comment. The, especially after 5G, now we're talking about 6G, and uh, the, there's now a convergence happening and overlaps. So you have neo-satellites as opposed to the traditional satellites. So communication is going to happen across a spectrum of mediums. It can be telecom, it can be the fiber, it can be satellites. So regulation is going to become a real nightmare because there's going to be serious overlaps and uh, it is going to be a serious lesson so I will come back to you on that, but uh, Anshul, what about you? Same question to you, because you have flagged sustainability. Uh, I think it's a very, very key point. And uh, uh, maybe, what are your thoughts? But I'd like to add, how does India make it a way of life? Mm -hmm. A very challenging question, though. So, I think it would, we had, as I said, uh, for me, it's a three-pronged approach. We have to look at technology. We have technological solutions. We have to look at behavioral solutions. And we have to look at a policy which empowers and enables all this to happen. So if recycling has to become a way of life, the first thing is, are we really creating information-based systems for people to really know uh, this? And uh, when I use the term information-based systems, I'm saying, I need to know while I'm buying a product, what is this made of? you know, the history of this to what do I do when it completes the end of its life to, you know, any possibilities related to it. And uh, what is my motivation to do it? Sometimes we confuse the motivation for a individual is only money. And uh, at times we have, we have always thought of, key, you know, if we have a deposit refund system that you bring back your old product, it will work. And uh, if we start looking at literature and, and review systems, 
it is not always the money, it is about how are we shaping the context in which people are operating. And that context will be created not just by offering some money, but by, you know, creating campaigns, uh, you know, talking, making it a part of our regular communication package. And today that is absent. Uh, you know, even when we talk about sustainability or about uh, product returns, uh, we talk it, you know, in a small, tiny line in a whole advertisement. So that doesn't cut it really. I mean, uh, it's not mainstream, it is not being discussed. Uh, and again, how will it be funded? So ultimately everything goes back to who is going to fund it. And uh, so one of the interesting things which I'd like to share on this part is we did some study on, uh, uh, focused on at least a few sectors, what's the cost of going circular? So which means that you are doing a complete end-to-end -end solutioning on right from creating technology to putting it on the market to you know getting your products back, getting them recycled, reutilizing the material. What we found is for majority of the sectors, the cost is, and I am when I use the term cost, I am loading it on the average selling price of the product. So the increase in the average selling price of the product is from 0.1% to 2 to 3%. For some categories, it may be higher, but we are talking relatively petty cost, something which can be written off. But still, you know, when you convert it at a company level, it becomes hum humongous. And that's where there is resistance to, to change. But I think until unless we start passing this cost to consumers, because this is minute, and also communicate the benefit of why this enables a huge change at a societal level, this is not going to happen. Uh, that's a great point. I think uh, accountability needs to be incorporate uh, when I was suggesting it's not just about industry I think my own segment media has to change and the point you talked about communication just give you a simple example day before yesterday the Unilever CEO was speaking at Fiki and uh, Alan Jope and he made this startling claim that uh, rising temperatures will cost companies 1.3 trillion dollars by 2026 and it'll end up 80 million people will end up losing their jobs and uh, tragically, I found it was a one centimeter story in the papers yesterday. And uh, go back uh, to July, RBI put out this public discussion document on sustainable finance. And uh, again, it was a one centimeter space story. So there is a need to, I think that's why I said there is a mindset reset required across this country. So which is why I was coming to it. This, uh, Jason, coming back to this regulation, uh, Sunil, I'll be coming to you too with off-syllabus questions. So, uh, you know, this business, what I mentioned about regulation, how do you see it? Because you, this is already an issue in the United States and Europe and everywhere. So how do you see, and regulation in India is just moving along the learning curve because technology is changing so fast. As the minister said, the data policy had to change because so much changed since 2019 to 2022. So how do you see regulation being approached in this new world? Yeah, I think I, I was uh, very heartened to hear the minister talk about the holistic look that they're taking uh, across uh, government of India to ensure that the economy, uh, the digital economy, the ambitious goals of becoming a $1 trillion IT economy in India, that those are all met. And I think the, uh, the quad of uh, regulatory analysis that we heard about looking obviously at the telecom actives we've been talking about, but also looking at the personal data uh, uh, bill uh, that will be reintroduced shortly, looking at the Digital India Act, uh, the update to the IT Act that's 20 years old. Uh, these are all very important analyses to undertake. But I do think the important uh, message that the tech industry is delivering to government of India is this is the dawn of the digital age uh, in India, India making an IT, in IT for the world. And it has the physical components that we've been talking about, the semiconductor uh, issue that, uh, that I mentioned earlier, but the digital components are equally, if not even more important. You can't hit a trillion dollar IT uh, economy without digital goods as part of the physical goods package. So uh, in the personal uh, data realm, for example, one uh, issue that we've been uh, very focused on is allowing Indian companies to export digital data and digital goods and services to the world. And there was a provision in the prior version of that bill called data localization that would have prevented the export of data across borders from, from India. 
which is punitive to India companies seeking to operate on a multinational basis. So our hope obviously is in the next version of that legislation that it will take a, a broader lens, a broader uh, look at the opportunities for Indian companies to compete around the world in digital goods. I also think it's incredibly important to focus investment opportunities not only on the physical goods, but also the intellectual goods, if you will, that India produces. There is no market in the world that is responsible for no, more of a genius quotient than the Indian market. The intellectual power of engineering and science and mathematics, of research and development that is present here in India is crucial for the world's economic success, not just India's. So when we think about investments, for example, in manufacturing, thinking about all that goes along with that, Sunil was talking about the importance of education investing and digital skilling, for example, which is crucially important. We heard that from the minister as well. So I think a regulatory approach that looks holistically at not only physical goods, make in India is incredibly important, the incentive program has been successful and will continue to be successful, but we need to have the digital component and the intellectual component that go along with that as well. So I think the regulatory approach that focuses on market failures, that's what the job of regulators is to do, to address market failures in a monopoly environment, that's incredibly important. In the environment we're in today, that's less important. Making sure that companies have an opportunity to compete is really what we're looking for regulators to do, to take a hands-off approach where there isn't that broken market that needs to be fixed. And I think the tech industry is, is the best example of that, where competition is flourishing and where the opportunities for the digital for future are most present. Thank you, Jason. I'll be remiss uh, in not making a comment in passing on the data localization part you mentioned. Data is a new oil, so why would India, uh, you know, comprom I mean, give up this opportunity to mine that data and allow it to be exported? This, no, don't expect a response, just making a comment in passing. Uh, we are at the 15 minute mark and uh, any questions we will take from the audience. If not, I'll continue. Yeah, I'm the Dean of the School of Government and Public Policy at the Jindal uh, Global University in Sonipat. Um, thank you, a very interesting session. But since Anit is chairing it, I have to make the comment that um, if, um, you know, Good journalism is about what are the big, big things that are happening in the world. And he pointed out that climate change and the comment made about the consequence of global warming received you know, three centimeters of notice um, in the print media uh, and less so, I think, in the electronic media. So my question is, in, in the discussion about the digital economy, I didn't hear a word about the other big thing that we have to worry about, which is growing inequality. And uh, I must say that uh, Mint has been educating its readers with what has ha actually happened, that uh, you know, India now has more than 100,000 US dollar millionaires, it has billionaires, and it becomes big news when Mr. Adani becomes the second richest man in the world for a few hours, and then lo and behold, how disappointing he falls back to being the third. This is the kind of media attention to what is actually a very serious problem. There are millions of people in this country who've been pushed below the poverty line uh, because of the pandemic. And in that period, a huge number of people have become enormously rich and wealthy. And so the consequences of this digital economy, digitalization on these people, the billions of people in this country, I think about 560 million so people. So can you... Uh, yeah, so I'm saying question? that what has digital economy to say or can give to people who are, you know, barely eking out a livelihood? And, uh, Jason, you want to go? Please. Well, thank you, Dean, for the question. And, and I would say uh, that the digital economy creates enormous opportunity to lift people up uh, in India and around the world. And I would give a couple of examples uh, here from India about what the digital economy has meant and will mean to citizens who do need to be lifted up. Access to financial services is key, uh, whether it's uh, online lending, online bank accounts, and the UPI platform that has been deployed here in India has connected more unbanked and underbanked citizens to the nation's financial services 
than any other country in the world. And India is building on economic success by providing access to financial services so that access to government benefits is electronic, not subject to theft or uh, disappearance or corruption. Uh, access to health services and health records is electronic. Imagine using this digital platform to access a specialist, a medical specialist, who's literally thousands of miles away in a village that has no access at all. Access to education, as Sunil was talking about, digital skilling is vital. And the process that the government of India has going on right now to digitize educational content for distribution over those platforms is uh, going to reach literally hundreds of millions of people that could not be reached before. Those are just a few examples. So I actually think the digital economy is lifting people up uh, in ways that India will be able to demonstrate to the world is the right way to do it. And thank you, Jason. Just to add to what he said, uh, 430 million people have got a bank account in the last 10 years. So uh, yes, it is being addressed. There's a gentleman there, and there was a lady's hand, I think, behind. Uh, yeah, there. My name is Shwetaj Singh. I'm the Managing Director of Knowledge Advisory. I have a question related to tech startups and deep tech Could startups in India. India. Uh, we have a survival rate of about 2 to 3% uh, of uh, tech companies, uh, and they usually die out in the third or fourth year due to lack of funding or various other reasons. And most of it is happening in uh, tier 2, tier 3 towns out of the big metros. Now. What I really wanted to ask the panel is, could you perhaps through PAFI reach out to state governments to create more of an enabling environment? Because there is a regulatory cobweb and it's tremendous. Some of these technologies are quite sort of converging technologies. And, and, and you have problems with uh, you know, one department or the other, which doesn't allow you to, to take those ideas or applications into sort of uh, so my question here, this was the preface. No, point taken, your so, actually so. Puffy on either side, and they are, by the way, been making this a strong case. I've been in sessions with them. So they will take up your request because this is a panel which are not part of Puffy, including me. So yeah, can we, that lady, yeah, thank you, sir. La that, uh, there's a lady there. Yes, ma'am. Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Vartika Tomar. Oh, yeah. I'm a scholar at the Indian School of Public Policy. And my question is at the intersection of circular economy and the behavioral side of public policy. So we realize the importance of circular economy. We know that it is significant. But when it comes to the Indian market, we, there's a certain kind of hesitancy which is, in, which is there. Uh, this, is a, this is a cultural obstacle that we face regarding products which are sustainable. So unless, un, uh, unlike a few so-called woke brands, most brands would not be interested to make sustainable products considering that the elder generation has that hesitancy towards those sustainable products. And it also increases the cost. So if my parents were to buy something which is more expensive and it doesn't have so-called fresh raw material used and it's like a sustainable product, they would not buy it. So how do you bridge this gap between uh, generations and the market and the, uh, sorry, the consumer and the market to incentivize them to make sustainable products not just for the woke brands, but for more and more brands. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think this is a, for me, a subset of how do we create a context which enables better decision making. Today that context is absent. Whether we talk at a company level, we talk at an individual level, we talk at an enterprise level, at all levels this context is missing. And uh, the first thing in our mind is, okay, what's the cost of the product? It's not about the longevity. It's not about, is it repairable? Is it uh, modular? Can it be recycled? Those matrices are just absent in the mind. So, and as I said, for me, it all boils down to, you know, will, is the price increased? Because we all think that a sustainable product necessarily has to be more expensive. The answer to it is not. From almost all the work, you know, if you start seeing, you know, which has been done globally now, uh, the cost increases are marginal at best. And uh, it is really not a choice that, you know, even if it's an increase, we are talking of, you know, petty increases of less than a percentage point on the average selling price of the product. So 
Uh, I don't think it's a choice of, you know, is it really expensive? The answer is no, it is not. Uh, it can be done. Yes, today certain companies are making sure that they want to have an extra cushioning, they want to have an extra margin on sustainable products because that's how it's being positioned. But if we really do a very thorough cost economic analysis, uh, it may or may not, you know, necessarily be that expensive. So uh, I think the end goal is, you know, utilize, you know, put some money, you know, increase the price if it needs to be by that tiny percentage point and use that money for communication, for creating that context for change to happen. Because until unless that context will not be talking about change will not be talking about change. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, uh, I am from the Indian School of Public Policy. This is actually a question for everybody, including Anil. <laughs> um, I'm glad. You know, uh, the minister talked about how, how do you go forward in public policy, which is give both sides when you do advocacy and build up trust. Now, Ishtiak and Pranshu and uh, Jason and Sunil, um, how do you guys do it? Do you uh, give both sides? And how do you build up trust? And Jason, particularly <clears throat> in the American context, how do you do it differently? Thanks. Sunil, why don't you go first? And uh, yeah. this is the last question, actually. Just got a note from the organizers. I need to wrap up. So brief responses, uh, so yeah. at the beginning. I, I don't think there's anybody better than Shailesh to ask that question, having <laughs> seen the industry, having seen bureaucracy, and now running a public policy school. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Shailesh, the way I uh, see it, I think the crux of it was what uh, the minister mentioned. Uh, it's not so easy, but from the industry perspective to go uh, looking for policy objectives which are supportive for the industry as a whole and not for the specific company. Uh, trying to look at the pros and cons and try to find the best balance because some of them may have different repercussions to different stakeholders. That transparency and that ultimate building of trust and that understanding of the domain from the industry perspective and understanding of the policy from the government perspective. How can we get this together is, is the best way forward and the most sustainable way forward. I think it's happening. I can tell you uh, from my own experience, uh, my last five years in Tata Steel where I was looking after corporate affairs, now uh, looking at an uh, aviation sector, I think that conversations are happening. Some of them may take longer, uh, some of them may happen quicker and like the minister said, in some cases the government is running faster than what the industry is running. So I think it's mostly about trust and it's mostly about credibility. So this consensus making process, which is not easy, which is, uh, takes time, uh, needs to happen and it starts with the trust. Absolutely agree with uh, Sunil's assessment. Uh, I start off every conversation this week, uh, meeting with Indian ministers and, uh, and secretaries, by saying you have ambitious goals. You're trying to reach 600,000 villages with broadband service that don't currently have it. How can we help you get there? That's how you build trust. You help them do their jobs. They're all well-meaning. They want to accomplish the goals that the Honorable Prime Minister has set for this country. And we can bring a global perspective from ITI of what's worked in different economies around the world, what the industry needs from government in order to deploy broadband to 600,000 villages, uh, how it could go better than it is going now, and how the industry can be a partner to government in accomplishing those goals. I think that's the way you build trust. You step in and you come from a place of wanting to help them accomplish what they're setting out to accomplish and bringing good information and good ideas about how to get there. Pancho, you have the last word. So for me, I think digitization play, will play a very significant role here. Asymmetry of information with everyone uh, plays a critical role uh, in building that trust. And uh, at least we are, if I talk from a circular economy point of view, we are start looking at digitizing a lot of information because until unless, you know, me and you have the same information, it's that information asymmetry which causes a whole lot of lack of trust. So digitization, I believe, has a very significant role here. So my response, I will outsource to Ajay Khanna, who, <laughs> who you all know. And he wrote, actually, was not being facetious, he actually wrote a great piece in Economic Times. Please ask him to share it with all of you. And uh, I just want to wind up thanking uh, Sunil, Jason, Pranju, and of course, my two colleagues on the either side. Hand off to Ishtiak. Thank you, Anil. When you have such an eloquent uh, panel, the word of thanks become easy because you don't have to sum up anything. I think most of the conversation has been very 
uh, very brief, very concise, and to the point. I think the uh, the way I would really like to thank each one of you is, Pranshu, thank you for showing us the mirror. And uh, I think it was at a PAFI when once I said that there should be a zero cost of candor. At least at PAFI, we have zero cost of candor. You can come and speak your mind and show us the mirror and say that, you know, you got to do this. Uh, Anil, you've always been very subtle and tough and put uh, the CEOs on spot by asking, uh, what will you do specifically rather than saying what needs to be done? I think we have a very unique situation right now because India, 20 years from now, wants to become a developed nation and also have the climate commitments and energy commitments. So while we want to double the per capita income, we also want to reduce the intensity of our energy by 45% in 2030. So on one hand, you are raising the intensity of the economy and you are bringing down the intensity of the energy and greenhouse gas emission and you know, a whole lot of other things in the recycling and all of that. So that's a conundrum. And I think there's no other country better place than us, no other forum better place than PAFI, which should actually take this audacious goal. So thank you very much on that. I think, I think what the takeaway for me here is that we need to have a social, ecological and economic harmony. And once that coexistence happens, I think we, will, we are on the right course. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you for being a very patient and engaged audience. Uh, I would request my colleague Deep Shika to hand over the token of appreciation to Sunil and Anil. Almost a rhyming word, Sunil and Anil. <laughs> Please hand it over to them and then I'll do the honors to Jason and Pranshu.